So, um, it's a pleasure to introduce Madan Rao. And it's always easy to introduce a speaker who has a Wikipedia page. So, Madan is the professor at the uh, International Center for Biological Sciences at TIFR. We need the Simon Center of Study of Living Machines. He was a, when I was a PhD student in Bangalore, he was the hotshot faculty in the neighborhood. And uh, from then, then he used to work in Raman Research Institute. From there, he went to NCBS. He has worked on membranes and biophysics of membranes and also on Martin sites. But today, he will mostly talk about membranes. Well, please. Thank you. Getting stuck. Is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Dhruv. And uh, so, Priya and out for inviting me here. Uh, this is my first visit to this cold place, and uh, but I really enjoyed the, the time here so far. Uh, so just a few oops, words about this uh, Simon Center. Uh, it's a center, a theory center embedded within a biology place, so it's quite unique in that uh, way. Uh, the advantage is that it makes us very, uh, that embedding in biology makes us very, uh, well, it forces us to be honest. and so. We constantly are uh, confronting experiments, working with biologists, but at the same time doing theory which is away uh, from uh, biology. Uh, and it's got seven uh, members out of a uh, total strength of NCBS uh, of around 35 to 40. So there's a high fraction of theorists within uh, uh, a biology institute. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, a new concept that we are trying to introduce, namely active force patterning. And so uh, what I'm trying to uh, sort of propose is that active force patterning is an organizing principle in the living cell. And while I'm going to discuss that, I will touch upon this notion of non-reciprocal interactions in living matter as a consequence of the breaking of time reversals in it. Okay, so uh, I hope um, each one of you, even though you're not involved in biology, will be able to uh, take something from this talk. Um, so, before I start, I just wanted to flash this very famous picture. I mean, all of you know the pe person in the middle, that's Richard Feynman, and that's uh, for Neumann, and that's Stanislav Ulam. And Ulam seems to be saying something to these two gentlemen, and what he's saying is this, ask not what physics can do for biology, ask what biology can do for physics. Uh, so this is a, uh, this sort of appeared in the recent uh, Nature article, uh, which uh, highlighted a certain new discovery of odd uh, viscosity in, uh, in starfish, in sort of a collection of starfish. And, and so, so the, the, the writer of that review uh, was inspired to quote this phrase. But, but uh, I think there's something, there's some, there's a lot of seriousness in that and so I'd like to, uh, I hope my talk will be uh, highlighting some aspect of, of why uh, biology actually is a new uh, test ground for interesting ideas in physics. Okay, so I'll first, because uh, uh, of the, of the uh, backgrounds of the, of the people here, I'll, I'll I'll first very quickly talk about active matter and how this has become a parad paradigmatic, non-equilibrium driven state of matter. Um, after which I'll talk about non-equilibrium forces and fluxes and I'll uh, talk about emergent non-reciprocal effects as a result of breaking of time reversal symmetry. Uh, and then I'll use these concepts to uh, look at three cellular realizations. One is non-reciprocal clustering in dense compressible fluids the other is active clustering and segregation on the cell surface. And finally, force patterning and the emergence of singular lines in the cytoskeleton. Uh, I may not talk about the second. This depends on whether I have enough time. Okay, so here's the, the canonical definition of active matter. Uh, active matter is a collection of particles, each of which is independently driven or powered by a free energy source, which is then transduced into mechanical work. So, by consuming, by every particle consuming energy, and I want to stress this, every particle consuming energy, this, this uh, 
the, this energy that is consumed is then dissipated into mechanical work. Mechanical work meaning it could, it could either induce motility or it could introduce, induce shape changes, conformational changes, etc. Okay. Now, because, uh, so this of course is very different from uh, the earlier uh, ways in which you could drive matter out of equilibrium. Uh, very typically stirred fluids or sheared fluids which are typically driven from the boundaries. This is driven at the scale of every particle, every constituent. Okay? Uh, now, of course this then uh, makes active matter <clears throat> a very um, singular non-equilibrium driven state of, of matter. And uh, typically what happens is that this driving due to the, uh, due to the powering uh, of every particle it breaks detailed balance and this leads to uh, non-equilibrium steady states that are not time reversal invariant. Okay. So this is non-Boltzmann steady states. Okay. Uh, so please do stop me if if need any clarification, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, I'd like to distinguish between two kinds of active matter. So these particles, namely these bees, are embedded in the medium. The medium could either be dry whereupon uh, momentum is dissipated into the medium or it could be wet where momentum is transferred to, the, to fluid motion. Okay, so it's good to keep these two classifications uh, uh, in perspective. Okay, now, uh, so as I said, active matter is a, is a, is a unique non-equilibrium driven state of matter and here are examples of this, the bees in the previous slide, living things in general, cells or cell extracts, swarms of birds, bees, schools of fish, etc., etc. But there are also non-living uh, synthetic analogs, namely active colloids, uh, shake, vertically shaken grains, uh, collection of nanorobots, etc., etc. Each of these things and much more come under the purview of active matter physics. Um, and as I said, each constituent particle is associated with an internal chemical cycle, uh, which as a consequence of being maintained out of equilibrium, sustains a steady current. The steady current that is that is sustained in each particle is then transduced into mechanical work and therefore every part, a constituent particle carries with it a dissipative times arrow. Okay. As a consequence of these of these two, uh, the steady state distribution is not time reversal invariant and can indeed carry uh, a current. Okay. And here is an, uh, a, a paper by my student uh, who is uh, who demonstrated and explicitly calculated the steady state distribution in the case of two unequal sized active particles embedded in a fluid. So even a simple realization shows a strong, a strong deviation from equilibrium. Okay, so I'll now talk about not, uh, the consequences of this, this uh, uh, activity and uh, the sustained current that goes through the system. So here, uh, let me just uh, uh, sort of demonstrate here uh, how time reversal symmetry is broken and the consequent uh, uh, physics of non-reciprocity. This can be easily seen in the case of self-propelled particles, particles that use that energy to move. Okay? So here you see that it, this is the start of thing, the red arrow tells you the direction in which it moves and this is an obstacle. And when this particle moves, it gets scattered like so and then moves in that direction. The time reversed, if I reverse the arrow of time, then that this, the particle just goes like so. Okay. So you can see that the forward movie is very different from the backward movie. Okay. Again, this is a consequence, this, this phenomenon is called non-reciprocity. Uh, you can also see this in a two particle cell, uh, two SPP scattering, two cell propelled particle scattering. You start off with a particle uh, oriented in this way and this particle oriented in that way. They, they scatter in this region and this particle then ends up there, this particle then ends up there. Now if I reverse the, uh, the arrow of time, you'll see that this particle just goes straight like so and this particle goes straight like so. Okay? So again, the time reversed movie is different from the forward movie. Okay? Uh, this has been highlighted uh, by Mike Cates and his uh, colleagues um, in the, a concept set, uh, that they call motility-induced phase transition or motility induced clustering, whereupon particles which are self-propelled like so can, because of collisions, align and cluster together. So this clustering 
which is like a liquid gas phase separation. This clustering is a consequence not of attractive interactions and so on, but purely because of kinetics. Okay. Yeah. So what are, what are the consequences of time reversal symmetry breaking at the micro scale? Uh, and this is where the, the full sort of glory of non uh, reciprocal interactions comes in. Um, for instance, the, the first thing that one realizes is that active systems are not bound by equilibrium rules in the sense that the forces need not be derivable from a potential. So F is not equal to the proportional to the gradient of a potential. Okay. This immediately means that these non-potential interactions uh, imply a violation of Newton's third law. That is, the force of I on J is not the same as the minus of force of J on I. And this is, you know, examples of this are, are easy to see when you look around you. Social interactions, A might like B, but B may not like A. Uh, predator prey, prey models, active colloids, living matter, all these are examples where violation of third law, of Newton's third law is, is uh, uh, happens. Okay. Now, uh, uh, a consequence of this, so this remember is, uh, these are not fundamental forces, these are effective forces obtained after the coarse grading over that chemical cycle. Okay. Uh, and now as a, as, a, as a consequence you find that even in the actions of external forces, a collection of particles which don't obey this, Okay, will will uh, will move the center of mass of that of that collection of particles will move. Okay? This is what you would call motility. Um, uh, interesting consequences are that again, as a result of of uh, of, of this condition, that the uh, uh, there is a uh, the work done depends on the path you take in uh, configuration space. Okay, uh, 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 again. Interesting uh, uh, consequences of the, of the same is that uh, there's a violation of fluctuation dissipation theorem. The fluctuations in general are not related to the response. So this is for a set of particles. You can do the same thing for fields. Uh, again, this is the consequence of time reversal symmetry breaking or non-reciprocity uh, in, in fields. Uh, time reversal symmetry violation affects the symmetry of the kinetic, uh, sorry, kinetic coefficients. Uh, usually, time reversal symmetry uh, implies that the kinetic coefficients have to be symmetric, but this, but uh, here the symmetry of the observed coefficients can be uh, violated. Okay. Uh, further, uh, in usual uh, statistical mechanics, equilibrium statistical mechanics, there's a relationship between observed coefficients and the variance of noise. Again, this is violated here uh, because of this. Uh, uh, what we will see is that. Uh, that there'll be the dynamical equations will contain terms which are not derivable from uh, an effective free energy, and this gives rise to non Hermitian dynamical matrices, which has interesting consequences. Okay, so uh, having now gone through the sort of abstract part of the talk, I'll try to see how those uh, those various aspects manifest in the three realizations that I'm talking about. Okay. So any, any questions before? This way? Yeah. So if this is formulated as, <coughs> formulated as a problem with extra components that absorb the like momentum yeah. and make the whole system conservative, will that make the formulation easier or uh, it won't help in this? So, so I, I, I think it's the first part. What was it? I said, so this is a non-conservative system basically, yes, yes. but if we include like some effective ah. extra components mm -hmm. that absorb the momentum, right. so the whole system becomes conservative, right. Right. will that help in any way or does it... Right, not so you could imagine, the, you, uh, so I guess what you are trying to say, and I, I think I agree with uh, what you are saying, is that suppose I have written down the microscopic equations for all degrees of freedom, which includes the internal degrees of freedom of the particle. Uh, then you're right. Then, then these effects will not be seen. Uh, but the equations, of course, will be very complicated because you have to write down equations for all the, you know, microscopic degrees of freedom that constitute the particle itself. So these are effective degrees of freedom, where I'm average, integrating over the internal uh, states of the object. 
Yeah. What I'm saying that suppose you also introduce effective environment degrees of freedom. Yeah. Which in such a way that in total, like the third law of Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, it may not be it may not be helpful. It may just complicate things. Just. Well, I, I wonder whether one can do it. I mean, I. I uh, I mean, the, the only way I would know how to restore all these things would be to add these internal uh, degrees of freedom and, uh, and, and yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah. So you talked about the chemical cycles, yeah. but assume that you have some, that the particles in your system, that they are, they, they have they have a time development, but it's not cyclic, you know, something that is decaying or something like that. Does right. that also fall into your uh, right. theory? Absolutely. So, so, uh, so there is, of course, a separation of time scales, as, as you're implying. And what, um, so I'm, I'm, what I'd like to say is that every particle has this chemical cycle, and this is a fast time scale. And you're integrating over this fast time scale to get the effective dynamics of particles at a slower time scale. The effective dynamics of the, of the particles at a slower time scale could be dissipated when and so on. So, does that answer the question? Yeah, I think it answered it in the sense that you are not considering systems where, you know, the, in, the internal the internal change is not cyclical because you want something that you want to pass mm. and, and a slow time scale. I want to do more That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Thank you. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I presume that you could, you could, for instance, have instead of having uh, this kind of cycle, you could say, okay, let me consider a ladder of states. No? Uh, and then there's no cycle, but you have, you know, back and forth. Is, uh, and uh, you're integrating over the time of this, uh, over of uh, you're integrating over a time scale which is larger than the transition time from one from the start to the end, and this would still work. Right. Okay. So uh, I'll just uh, come to this slide. So typically in in uh, in living systems, uh, the energy input at the scale of every particle is driven by a chemical energy, schematized like so. Uh, and, and, and typically what happens is that, uh, you know, between states, let's say one and two, there's an energy input through the hydrolysis of ATP. And you see there's an imbalance between the arrows, one going to two and two going to one. So this is supposed to schematize the fact that you're breaking detail balance. And as a consequence of this, of this uh, imbalance, uh, of uh, of transition rates, you drive a, a cyclical current, okay, which is which we represent by J. So J is a sustained current that is maintained in a lot of these processes in cells due to um, by having a fixed chemical potential associated with the ATP going to ADP and uh, phosphate. Okay. So what the cell does is to is to maintain the levels, the relative levels of ADP versus ATP fixed. Okay. And by doing that, it generates a gradient of chemical potential which drives the current. Okay. Now, this, this current that is driven in this, for instance, can be used to do all kinds of things. In particular, it can be used to do mechanical work and apply stresses and forces. And so, myosin, which is a molecule which is famous for, for transducing this energy into mechanical stresses, gives rise to around 14, 14 pascals of uh, of, uh, of stress, okay, first cycle. Okay, this is as I said that this this cycle, this chemical cycle, uh, can be used to do all kinds of things in biology. It shows you can see this is a tissue uh, which undergoes huge shape deformations, uh, and the shape deformations shape deformations are driven by the chemical cycles that I talked to you about. This is a cell which was initially static and it now moves. So this is scales of fish, which you just take it from the skin, the, the scale, and then put it on a glass plate, and it spontaneously moves. Okay? And the movement is also triggered by these kind of chemical cycles. Um, here you'll see that this is, this is a very famous uh, uh, movie. Uh, and 
and this is a neutrophil, which is in, in one of the uh, uh, cells in, in, in the blood, and this is chasing after the little ma macrophage. Okay. But you can see that what it's doing is, is not only moving, but it's sensing, it's making an inference, and then following that, that little tiny object. Okay. All right. This is remarkable, because in the back of the mind, these guys are just agglomerates of chemicals. Right? But somehow, the idea of that by viewing with, with life, namely by driving it out of equilibrium, you can uh, drive it to do all these interesting functions. Okay, so this, this is again non-reciprocal, as you can obviously see. Okay, so um, I'll now uh, try to talk about something like the sensing and, uh, and seeking in a very simple system namely a system of active particles in a dense compressible fluid. Okay? And the motivation for this work was because uh, we were interested in the organization of chromatin DNA in the nucleus. And uh, chromatin, is, uh, uh, what, what happens is that certain regions of the, of the chromatin uh, like to move uh, towards each other. And by moving towards each other in clustering, these, these regions are called enhancer promoter regions. You don't need to know what they are. But the point is that these regions come together in an active way and form clusters. Okay, and, and there's been a lot of uh, uh, work on trying to understand this, this dynamics uh, and it's still not very clear what happens. Uh, and so the picture that I'd like you to take in mind is this polymer here, which is the chromatin. Okay. And, uh, and there are little, little regions that I talked about, those red regions which are actively extruded and move and they, as I said, they form clusters, okay? But this polymer is embedded in a dense medium of the nucleus, okay? So uh, now as a, as a first uh, 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 take on this, on this problem, I'm going to sort of remove the complications due to this polymer, okay? And I'll just look at active particles embedded in a very dense medium and ask for how do they move, okay? Okay, so, so we'll look at this much simpler problem. We'll, we'll overlay the uh, polymer aspects later. I, mean, I won't come that, uh, to that part in the talk, but let's just look at this system. A dilute concentration of these active particles embedded in a passive, dense medium. Okay? And the obvious equations to write down would be that I, I write down Newton's laws with damping. So that this is Newton's laws with damping. But of course, those particles, namely these red particles, they are, they are uh, in, in this set A, okay, are uh, a, a push with a certain force F, okay? And, and these inert particles just obey this equation. But if the particle belongs to the set, namely one of these red particles, it has this, uh, these terms and this forcing term. And of course you can put a noise, okay? An orientation noise, which is the, the, the nose of the particle, which moves for a while and after a certain time scale tau, it decorbics and moves up. Okay? So that's the dynamics, a simple dynamics. Now, what's interesting is that if I, if I tune the magnitude of this active force or the correlation time tau, then you see that there's a jamming and jamming transition. For small f, for small magnitude of forces or for small tau, okay, the thing is jammed, the, the velocity of, the part of that active particle is zero, and at a particular value, uh, beyond a certain threshold, it takes off. Okay? So there's a jamming and jamming transition. Yeah? Now, uh, so this is obtained by numerical solution of these equations. Uh, but now it'll be, uh, let's try to uh, go beyond these numerical uh, solutions and ask for what are the hydrodynamic equations that we could write down as a, from this. Okay. Uh, it gives more insight by, by uh, by, by looking at it in this perspective. So let's call the dense uh, rho as the density of these background particles. Okay? Because there are many, many more background particles than the, than the active particles. This is a, a, a fine description. Of course, the density rho has to obey a conservation law. So d rho by dt is just injected by this velocity b. Okay? Uh, as a, the particle, so that is mass balance. You're next instructed to write down equations for force balance. Right? The sum of all forces should be equal to zero. 
So there's a frictional force. So V here is the velocity of these background particles. Uh, there's a frictional force which is balanced by local viscosity and a local pressure which comes from compressing two particles together. Okay? If this particle overlaps with that particle, there's a pressure, local pressure proportional to rho square. Okay? And the gradient of the pressure is what this is. Okay? And this here uh, is the forcing on the background due to this, these particles. Okay? So that's the, that, that's the active part of, the, of this force balance equation. We will then write down, uh, so, so this here, these two equations tell you what is the dynamics of the background, which, which is driven by the forces that, uh, that the particle acts on, that the active particle acts on the background medium. Here now are, this is the dynamics of the active particles themselves. The active particle velocity okay, is proportional to the, to the active force and it moves along the direction of the nose of the active force. Okay? So that's the, that is this two equations. But of course, there's a back reaction coming from the, from the medium itself. And the back reaction tends to impede the movement of the particles. Right? So, this, so the back reaction has exactly the same form here, except that the coefficient could in principle be different. So this is the equation that the active particle uh, has. And this uh, theta here is the orientational noise in the nose of this, uh, of the arrow associated with this active particle. So these are the hydrodynamic equations uh, to lowest order, uh, uh, which are, uh, you know, which, uh, which describes the same physics as this, as this uh, microscopic theory. Uh, but now let's see what we can do with this. Let's now look at the case of a single active particle. So now I just have one active particle in a moving like so, in a background of this, uh, of the dense medium, okay, and is moving. So let's write down, so now it's convenient to go to the co-moving, co-rotating frame of this active particle, rewrite the equations that I talked about, and try and solve them, okay, Re rewrite these equations and try and solve them. You can solve them using a perturbation uh, theory, okay, to linear order in, in deformations. And what you find is, a, is, is uh, something quite um, non-obvious. What you find is that this moving particle, when it's moving in this dense background, it produces a wake. Okay? And the wake is not, though it's a single particle, the wake is not isotropic. Okay? It's an anisotropic wake. And that's clear because it's moving. Right? So that's, that's the one which breaks the anisotropy. However, so that may not have been too surprising. But what's surprising is that the, the profile of the wake in front of me is different from the profile of the wake behind me. Okay? And indeed, the profile of the wake, so this is the, this is the profile of the wake in front of me, this is the profile of the wake behind me. In front of me, there's a decay, there's an exponential decay, largely governed by this term. Okay? But behind me, the exponential uh, that, that is here exactly cancels the exponential that's there, and you get a power law decay. Okay, so this is the power law decay, which decays as one by uh, u to the power of three by two. Okay, a power law decay, and this this is the conformation of the power law decay by uh, numerical solutions using this equation. Okay, so this, this is this is quite a surprising result that a moving particle in a dense medium actually has breaks this forward aft symmetry. Okay, it produces this break. Okay, can I ask? Yeah. Why is that more surprising than when a boat go through water? It looks different in the front than in the front. <laughs> this is true. Uh, that's true. So, the, so I, I can tell you what's the difference in the two. Uh, so, um, no, it, it, it is very similar. I mean, the, uh, except except I'm not very sure about how it decays. Uh, maybe it does decay. Uh, yeah, it does decay. Uh, uh, Yeah, you have a round thing, right? Right, a single, yeah, but... The boat has a... Like, sure, but... So but you're right. I can answer to it was a question. No, the, the surprise is one way because if the boat is moving extremely slowly, mm. yeah, in zero Reynolds number, then it doesn't break the 4 f symmetry. It's only at a certain Reynolds number that it breaks the 4 f symmetry. Mm -hmm. But here you are moving extremely slowly. Here you are moving because slowly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but you are still breaking the. But it's right. So, so I guess, okay. 
Maybe it's not really surprising, I guess. Uh, uh, but it was, it was unexpected. It, uh, so the, 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 the physics that you talk about is, is due to the hydrodynamics of the fluid, right? And it's interesting that you can only, leave, in that context, you can only leave a wake in even dimensions. So if the boat was moving in th a 3D fluid, there is no wake behind it. Okay, and that's an interesting consequence of uh, of uh, the wave equation, and uh, is like the Huygens wavelets, you know. So the in three dimensions, the Huygens waves exactly cancel out. That's why when light propagates through here, you don't see a wake. So in 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 even dimensions, you do leave a wake, but here it happens in any dimension. I mean, this is just a curious assignment. But, uh, but this has nothing to do with, uh, you know, this has to do with load and all this number. Mm, it's not a fluid, it's a, comp it's a compressible fluid. So, yeah, okay. That's the difference between what you just said and, and this. But I agree that once you, once you realize what, uh, your point, it's not too surprising that there's a four half symmetry. After all, the moving particle is breaking that, that symmetry. So, yeah. This is a compressible isotropic system, but because it's moving, yeah. it does. Uh, okay, so now, so so this is what a single particle does. Now let's put two particles in it. Okay, and uh, and we'll again do do this in a low uh, low lowest order uh, thing. So if you have a particle in front, it leaves an algebraic decaying wake behind it. But if there's a particle here. You see, then it is exponentially in front here, but decaying there. So you can see that the profile that this sees is different from the profile that this sees. Okay, so you can you can show, for instance, that the velocity of the of the moving particle is equal to that old is, is equal to the forcing term for that particle uh, plus two contributions. One is the self contribution, is like a self uh, field that's created by this moving particle. And the other is because the second particle is inducing this term in the first particle. Okay, and 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 so this term, uh, you know, uh, will say that the dynamics of the first particle has a contribution uh, coming from the second particle, and the dynamics of the second particle has a contribution coming from the first particle. But because there was a four half symmetry breaking, these contributions are different. Okay, and what is the consequence of that? What you see is the following. If you have two particles which are moving, initially moving behind each other, then these particles, this particle will seek that particle and go and hurriedly try to reach it. Okay? And this, the relative speed or the relative, uh, the relative distance between these two particles scales with a certain power law here, which we can check uh, from numerics. Okay? Uh, similarly, if the two particles are moving like so, parallel to each other, then they will converge. Okay? Uh, and the distance between uh, the particles scales like so. Okay? So this is interesting consequences of this, this uh, uh, asymmetric anisotropic wake that is being uh, left behind. And this is indeed an is uh, the um, non-reciprocity that I'm talking about. The effect of particle 1 on particle 2 is different from the part effect of particle 2 on particle 1. Okay, so this is for single particle and two particles. What about many particles? And I hope this movie plays. Yes, it's playing. Uh, so let me just start from again. So here, yeah, here you see the particles were parallel to each other and then they very quickly formed this, this clusters. And here they were behind each other. And, oops. No. And you see, they come, they come together. Yeah. So, so this is an interesting kind of clustering uh, that is seen not because of particle-particle interactions, but because of its how an active particle couples to the medium and how the medium feeds back onto the particles. Okay. So, um, we are now trying to work on various, uh, hopefully, some cellular and tissue level implications of this. Um, but I don't have much to say about that yet. Okay. Uh, so now, uh, how much time do I have? Um, 50 minutes. 
Fifty. 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 Okay. So then I'll, I'll certainly skip this then. And let me just go. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll come. I'll come back to this in case uh, I have time. Yeah. So, but I, I wanted to talk to you about this because it's, it's something that we've done recently, and I'm quite excited by this. So, this is the notion of force patterning and singular lines in the cytoskeleton. And here's the problem that I want to talk about. Uh, you know, what you see here is is the cell, and in green are these actin filaments. They are stiff polymers, and they are they basically straddle straddle the entire uh, interior of the of the of the cell. And indeed, it gives rise to the, the, the integrity, the shape of each cells. Uh, when the cell has to change its shape or when it has to move, something has to be done to these actin, actin cytoskeleton. Okay? Um, and, and what you see here is the same actin cytoskeleton, but forming these, these uh, uh, you know, excitable waves. Right? In coexistence with these, these filaments. So, 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 um, so this is what uh, I'm, I'm quite uh, interested in about how the active forces generated by this actin and myosin, this, 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 uh, this set of filaments, uh, how they uh, result in long-range dynamic force patterning, which is cell spanning, and together with excitability. So there seems to be a coexistence of excitable, uh, you know, waves and these singular stress fibers, okay? So, yeah, so, um, so just a, a word because you may not be familiar with uh, actin, I just very quickly want, uh, want to say that uh, the, the uh, active component here now is this combination of motor proteins, they are called myosin, and these actin filaments, okay? And you can see for instance, and this is, this myosin is what consumes uh, ATP energy. And, and because of that, it moves along that filament. And so if I hold the myosin, the filament will move with respect to the myosin, okay? So what you have here is that this active agent gives rise to a current because this entire, this object will move. Similarly, it can give rise to local stresses, which can either be contractile, I pull along this long axis, or I push along the long axis, namely extensile. Now, because there is a asymmetry, between compressing, compression and e extension, as uh, as uh, he, he, he as you uh, showed me in the morning, uh, this this will give rise to a net uh, compression. Okay, so imagine that you have a meshwork of this actin filaments all through the cell, and you have this myosin which uh, which sits on this uh, on this meshwork, then it will uh, give rise to a net compression. Okay. This compression is called a contractile force. Okay, okay so now, so what, what, uh, uh, what do we want to uh, try and say? So what we want to say is how do local active forces associated with this actin and myosin uh, constituents, how do these local active forces drive dynamic long-range force pattern, and, uh, such as stress fibers and excitability? Uh, and so what, we, uh, what we'd like to show is that if you have a cell which has some meshwork of actin, okay, then by putting in myosin on it, how does this meshwork give rise to these kind of structures? Okay? Dense, thin, singular fibers in, embedded in this meshwork itself. Okay? Uh, we can do this uh, just, uh, yeah, you could imagine that you have either one myosin one species of myosin in this embedded in the cell, or like so, so that, that this, this would be myosin rich regions, and out here will be myosin poor regions, or you could have two different species of myosin A and B and decorated like that. Okay? The, the theory holds for all these different contexts. But just to keep, uh, uh, for you to keep uh, this thing, just, just think of this that if you have, you, you could have myosin rich regions drawn in these dark lines and mice and poor regions on the outside of these documents. So this is what we want to see. How do you go from here to there? Okay. Um, yeah. Now one thing uh, that one realizes about mice is that they are they are they are mechanochemically sensitive. That is, uh, you if I if myosin is bound to a filament, 
and you yank or pull on on myosin, it holds more. Okay? These are called these are called catch pots. Yeah, it's like a seed bed or something like that. No? So you you yank it, it holds back. Okay, uh, and so 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 typically myosin has this catch bond behavior. Okay, which means that the bond, the lifetime of that of that bond, as a function of force, shows an increasing uh, dependence like that. At very large forces, it comes down, but for small forces, it does it has an increasing dependence. Okay, this would be important because we'll need to put in the fact that these myosins not only generate force by contraction, but they sense force because their turnover, their unbinding, depends on the local spin. Okay. So these are force generators and force sensors. Okay. So now again, again what we do is we write non-hydrodynamic equations. Hydrodynamic equations are just force balance and mass balance equations at the simplest level. Okay. And so uh, what, you, what you do is you want to describe, uh, let's say, a cell whose interior looks like this or like, uh, like this. And you want to describe this by a local displacement field U. Okay. So this is the, uh, this is the equation that uh, governs force balance. It says that the local membrane velo velocity in this high, this high uh, low Reynolds number regime is equal to a sum of the forces, local forces. And the forces that act on it are elastic forces, active forces because of myosin, and dissipative forces because of viscosity. Okay, so that's this set of equations. The, the uh, active forces that myosin uh, 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 applies on the meshwork is both a function of the local mesh, uh, the actin density and the local myosin density. So please bear that in mind. Uh, the next equation would be the equation of mass balance of the myosin. Uh, lo the local time derivative of, of uh, myosin is advected by the moving mesh, okay, and it could diffuse, okay. But also there is a turnover, namely uh, myosin can unbind and bind onto the meshwork, and the unbinding of the of the myosin, as we said, depends on the strain. It's a catch point. So this is this is the physics that goes. In. It's a simple physics: force balance and mass balance. And uh, uh, highlighted in this yellow are the active contributions. Okay, this is active because this is an active. Act, uh, this contributes to the active force. It depends on density of myosin. Similarly, this is the unbinding of myosin, which depends on the local active stresses. Okay, now it's convenient to, you know, when you write this equation to rewrite this, this equations in, in sort of this form, okay, where uh, phi here is the difference between, so rho 1 and rho 2 are the high uh, enrichment with myosin and lower enrichment with myosin. Okay, so that's the, that's the excess density and this is the average density. Okay, so the excess, local excess density, local average density. And in terms of these equations, the previous these equations just can be read out easily. Now, what is the... Um, what is epsilon? Sorry? What is epsilon? Uh, the strain, uh, which I haven't written. Yeah, epsilon is just the strain. Yeah? Okay, uh, so... So now, it, uh, uh, if you unpack, you know, so so this quantity, of course, the sigma here has three parts, right? It has three com uh, contributions to the force. Elastic force, which we just take it to be linear elasticity. Uh, an active force coming from myosin, uh, coming from this formula, which you can write down, and a dissipative force. And if you unpack this this form of the uh, of the active force, and, and then plug it back into these equations, you find that there's a renormalization of the elastic forces. And normal, if we had started off with a linear elastic, elasticity theory, namely stress is proportional to strain with an elastic constant B, uh, what happens when you unpack this is that you generate a non-linear elastic contribution. Okay? And that's really interesting. The reason why that is interesting is that activity alters the elastic energy landscape favoring local contractile regions. You see that there are now two minima in the, before we started off with this linear elasticity theory, a single minima at, at the zero strain. But now because of activity, the single minima gets split up into two minima. Okay? And therefore there is a chance that locally you could sit in this non-trivial minima, which will give rise to local contractile regions as uh, shown 
uh, as shown here. Okay? So you can see that the physics is already coming up. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Now, as I said, okay. So now let's just uh, pause for a while and then look at this equation because it's quite a neat, uh, neat equation. And I've rewritten this equation here. Uh, before I started off the activity, the stress was merely proportional to strain. Sigma equals V into epsilon. Okay, and V was the elastic modulus. Okay. But now, because of activity, there's a renormalization of the elasticity, and you get this nonlinear dependence. Sigma on the left hand side, the stress, the stress tensor, has this nonlinear dependence on the strain, okay, given by the epsilon squared and epsilon cube terms. Okay. But there's also interesting uh, uh, contributions here. Uh, for instance, one of the things that you get is that you get a back pressure, and again, again, which comes from the, uh, from activity. And this is like a negative pressure that, that is uh, that's being applied in the system. And the other consequence is that this coefficient B is no longer the passive contribution, the passive elastic force, but this quantity here is renormalized to this lowest order by this uh, expression. So what does this mean? Note the negative sign here. Yeah? What this means is that I can, by increasing the excess uh, minus in density, I can make the elastic modulus negative. Okay, so this is this is an interesting uh, uh, interesting feature. It, it changes what's known as elliptical elasticity to something called hyperbolic elasticity. Okay, and, and the consequence of that is that it gives it gives rise to rays. Okay, normally if you take a solid and apply a point force here, and look at how does the stress propagate within the solid, it will propagate diffusively like so. Okay. But because of this uh, feature of driving the local elastic models to, to negative values, the equations turn out to be hyperbolic, which means if I put a point source on, on the solid, it will propagate not diffusely but like, like rays. Okay? So that's a really interesting uh, consequence uh, of this. This is the origin of force chains and all the singular features that happen there. Uh, there's been a lot of work uh, in recent times about force chains in granular systems. This is akin to that, but different. Okay. Now, um, now let's let's take these equations and now sort of do a linear stability analysis. And I'll very quickly go through this. Uh, what we what we find, uh, this, uh, so this is a phase diagram, which is the relative cons uh, contractility. The fact that we, uh, uh, the excess contractility versus the relative unbinding of this uh, of this uh, bias. Okay, and you find that in, in large regimes of parameter space, uh, what you find is a segregation in severity. Namely, if you start off with a uniform distribution of uh, of um, bias on that on that mesh that I talked to you about, on this on this mesh here then immediately it segregates like so. Okay? And, it, and the, it, the, uh, the analysis gives you uh, uh, what is the fastest mode of segregation. Okay? So it tells you that there's a segregation instability. Now this is interesting because normally if you take two components like oil and water the, and, and cool it to low temperatures, then they segregate. And they segregate because there's a gradient in chemical potential. Oil likes to be next to oil, water likes to be next to water. Yeah? So the attractive forces between oil and oil and water and water. Here, the two myosin species that I talked about don't have any interaction at all. Right? They are interacting with each other via the elastic medium, and the segregation that you see here is generated as a result of this uh, of this interaction with the elastic medium. Okay. So normally, uh, uh, normally when you have so what I've shown so far is that a homogeneous initial configuration of uh, of uh, myosin very quickly undergoes a linear pretty towards segregation. So you have row 1, let's say, in this orange patch, and row 2 in the blue patch. Okay? And now, of course, uh, uh, as uh, any physics uh, uh, student will say, uh, non-linearities will kick in. Linear stability analysis only works for very, very short times. Uh, beyond a certain time scale, non-linear non effects will kick in. And usually, what non-linear effects do is to temper the exponential growth that's predicted by the instability analysis to an as slower algebraic growth, okay, and give rise to domains such as these. 
So these, these domains will grow, 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 grow till they encompass the system. This is what you see in oil and water, blue lipids, uh, on the membrane, etc. Et right? This is conventional coarsening dynamics of phase separation. What happens here? Something very dramatic happens, and this is the following. Again, after the initial uh, 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 linear instability, what happens is that you start getting regions such as these. That is, regions where here there is more myosin compared with there. And as a result, these two interfaces, the left interface and the right interface, are actually forced to come towards each other, forming singular lines such as these. So it grows initially, okay, then very quickly it forms these singular lines. Okay? It doesn't grow forever. And this is the, and in fact, what we can do a sort of finite times uh, singularity analysis to show that these singular lines, these, these lines actually form uh, singular structures with the excess concentration of myosin scaling like so, with the, two, uh, with the one third exponent, and the strain, because it, it, there's more myosin there, there's more strain, and the strain in, increasing logarithmically, uh, logarithmically at a finite time T0. So this gives rise to finite time singularities. Okay. So it's very different from what you would expect in, uh, in equilibrium segregation. And, and uh, here are some uh, pictures which I'll, I'll show you. Okay. Again, you can see the formation of lines, and they form these lines. Now it's looping, and so it will come back. But you can see that this is very, very different from, from um, equilibrium segregation. Uh, okay, I'll skip this. Uh, okay, uh, these, here are some sort of experiments that were carried out by some other group uh, where they showed how, uh, how these um, lines of actin, uh, enriched actin and myosin emerge from a background of already existing actin filaments. Okay, so this is very consistent with uh, our uh, calculations that I showed you. Uh, again, more experiments. Here this shows a cell in, in a micro-patterned plate. Uh, here you have actin within the cell, but there is no myosin. You put in a drug which, which uh, uh, doesn't allow myosin to be contracted, and you get this kind of picture. But as soon as you wash the drug and allow the uh, myosin to bind onto actin, you see the, the emergence of these lines. Okay? Again, very, very, uh, very uh, akin to what I just described. Uh, how much time do you have? No more. No more. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was going to tell you something about uh, non-homation matrices, but I'll just uh, leave it there. Uh, and but just to just to say that uh, uh, that the analysis the, that we have uh, very definitely shows that in conjunction with these singular stress fibers that emerge as a consequence of the. Uh, post coarsening dynamics that I, uh, that I uh, showed here, you also get this kind of traveling wave patterns. Okay. And, uh, and for instance, this is an, uh, a numerical simulation of, of uh, those equations, but one can do this analytically and show that you get traveling wave patterns. Uh, okay, so in, in the future, one of the things that we uh, are planning to do is to put in the other interesting component that happens in cells. Uh, apart from actin, which is these, these red filaments, there is also a filament known as, a set of filaments known as microtubules. And what we want to do is to arrive, you know, put both these things in the same uh, theory. Okay. Uh, why, do we, uh, uh, why do we need to do this? And the, the interesting difference between these two is that this is a tensile thing, it's like a rope which, which resists pulling, yeah? uh, but uh, is easy to compress. And this one is like a strut, like a beam, which holds compression. Okay? Uh, this and these are the two elements, these two elements, this compressive and tensile uh, structures are what govern the stability of a cell. It's quite remarkable, and let me tell you why it's remarkable. Uh, it's remarkable because of this. Uh, here is Buckminster Fuller, and, uh, who was an engineer of, uh, of some repute. And uh, uh, 
he had thrown a challenge to uh, engineers and architects a long, long time back, uh, saying, can you build a stable structure which is not stabilized because of compression, which is what our buildings are, but stabilized because of tension. Okay? So here are the compressive elements, the sticks here, but you can see that, that in between these sticks are these thin little strings. Okay? And this is stabilized not by the sticks, but by the strings. Okay? So you segregate the tension elements and the, and the compressive elements. And as I said, uh, that, uh, that it's stabilized because of these strings. And this, the structures are called density structures, from tension and integrity. Now, of course, if you look at Wikipedia, there are many, many such um, structures that you can buy from, from shops. Uh, but the interesting thing is that in 19... Uh, in uh, yeah, in that, that time, uh, Donald Ingber from uh, from Harvard suggested that this, the mechanical structures of cells are indeed these density structures, and he just proposed this as an idea. Uh, there were there are some level of experiments which suggest this, uh, but the reason why this has excited us now is that we believe that we can we by using the formalism that I just described to you, and including both actin and microtubules will be able to arrive at the dynamical theory of density. And uh, that's what we are aiming to uh, take up next. So to summarize, um, uh, I uh, wanted to talk about non-equilibrium force patterning uh, as, as, a, as a principle in, 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 the, in, the, in the cell, because based on this overall cell, cell spanning uh, force patterning, all the other organelles, etc., get uh, located within the cell. Okay, the location of different organisms within the cell is contingent on this kind of pattern. Okay. Uh, and what I talked to you about in the last part of the talk, I talked about uh, emergence of stress fibers uh, and, with, and coexistence with excitability. And as I said, what we'd like to do next is to uh, derive a dynamical theory of density. Uh, and, so I'll just, by acknowledging the people whom, uh, who I work with, uh, the, uh, these set of uh, people, and Sajita Tripoli, who is a faculty member in, in Science Center, uh, we uh, did the work on the first part of the, uh, that I talked about, about the about non-reciprocity of active particles in a dense uh, compressible medium. Uh, I didn't talk about their work, and Ayan and uh, Satarshi did uh, the work on the um, on the uh, on the stress fibers and, and the active side So thank, thank you very much. So thanks for the for a very interesting talk and this was a very special colloquium because we didn't have much audience but we actually had a discussion which never happens in the colloquium. Um, any questions? Yeah, I mean, the structure that you observe, basically. That we observe experimentally. Uh, that's it. Uh, so, no. <laughs> but, but, uh, so, if we're trying to get there, uh, so, so far, you know, in, the, in those uh, pictures that I talked about, uh, those, these, these things, uh, uh, so, that, that, all the calculation there was done for a sort of uh, unbounded system. There are no boundaries. Yeah. Uh, but now, with which I didn't talk about, uh, we can place boundaries. There are these anchoring points here. And these are called focal additions in the cell. And they are known to give rise uh, uh, to these stress fibers. Yeah. So, it, so, so in the absence of the boundary, you just have moving lines, singular lines which are moving all over. Uh, they have to be stabilized by some anchoring. Okay. And so, our, our idea uh, is now to try to see if we can, uh, you know, so, so the point is that if I uh, give you one set of anchoring uh, geometry, mm -hmm. yeah, that will give rise to a given steady state. 
uh, if I change the geometry ever so slightly, then the whole steady state changes. So this is what has been called a fragile matter. But it's a different, in, in, in granular systems you have fragile matter, but this is held. In those things it's fragile matter because of compression, but here it's because of tension. When you say steady state changes, you mean the whole, the pattern is different. Yeah, yeah, exactly, the pattern is different. Okay. Correct, correct. So it's difficult to address your question because, you know, these guys, in reality, this is very dynamic. Uh, in, in our calculation, we have introduced the dynamics of the, of the focal additions. We're just put, using it as boundary conditions. So, but I, I think the, the goal would be to do precisely what I'm suggesting that. Try to build a bigger theory which allows for uh, you know, the, the correct uh, experiments to compare this with would not be just a cell on the thing, because it's, it's very uncontrolled. So, the correct experiments are these kind of experiments, uh -huh. on these micro pattern surfaces. These, you know, because here you can, now you can control where you want to put these, see, these vocal additions. So, this is actually an experiment which shows the dynamics of this. Right? So, this is precisely the kind of experiment we should be addressing, and we'd like to do that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this was a very interesting talk. Did it work? Uh, maybe general power. Okay. No, it's, it's okay. It's still great. So this was a very interesting talk, and as an outsider, I think I can run my imagination. I can let my imagination run <laughs> and ask you lots of questions, <laughs> but I will prevent myself from doing that. So okay, but I have basically two or three questions. So. One is that you mentioned that uh, this particle, basically this active particle, could have different scales. It could, could be a cell, it could be yes. an organ organism, yes. it could be a bird or a bee. Yes. Uh, so in which case is the approximation more accurate? Uh -huh. Is it like for larger objects or smaller objects? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, good question was a difficult to answer. Uh, uh, right. So if you're looking, at, so for instance, uh, yeah. So I guess so. So what I've talked about so far are hydrodynamic theories, and they certainly work uh, best if you're looking at length scales and time scales, which are much larger than the particle size, uh, and uh, uh, at time scales which are longer than the cycle time of each, of each uh, particle. Um, now, uh, so that's, that's one statement, but you know, uh, applying these kind of theories to different systems such as let's say bees or uh, birds or cell extracts, uh, you leave out many, so they, they, these, you leave out many uh, confounding features. For instance, if you want to study bees, then it's not only uh, you know the mechanics, but also perception, which is totally uh, not included in this. There are efforts to include that, and there uh, very very good uh, uh, good work on that. Mm. Uh, but still, there's a lot to be uh, explored in that area. Uh, there's lots of uh, open questions uh, to do with even what used to be thought to be well understood flight of birds and it's still not uh, understood in great detail. Um, uh, now in the case of uh, the cytoskeleton, of course you don't have that problem, you don't have perception and so on and so forth. But of course you have many, many ingredients, more molecular ingredients that might uh, be, uh, be there. The, the other problem about, uh, about this is the, uh, you know, that experiments the experiments have been defined in very well controlled ways and that's, that's the problem with uh, trying to compare any of these kind of theories with experiments. So, so it will take some time for, for, the, for the two things to converge, but it's slowly happening. There, is a lot of, there are a lot of so-called in vitro experiments that are being done now, which, uh, which have different levels of com complexity put in. Uh, and uh, which hopefully we can we can uh, address uh, some of these things. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
have for more questions? Sure. Uh, okay, so you show this movie of this blob following a small object. Yeah. And so, uh, and that, so then essentially what you described later in, in terms of this object yeah. moving and generating awake would yeah. explain yeah. that. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, now if one is biased by conservative physics, yeah. then you expect that a small object moving will not cause a big object to follow it. Right. But it's more understandable that a big object moving would True. make a small yeah. True. So what you see is essentially entirely because of this active. Yeah. That even a small object is okay. able to cause a big object okay. to follow okay. basically. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I have I also have two questions yeah. that are related to it. Yeah. How are this asked? So uh, so, uh, regarding the small microphage, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, so the black cell following the microphage, mm -hmm. regarding that point, uh, so uh, are you saying that it's more because of the active nature of the system and not because the microphage is leaving some chemical trails? No, no, it's certainly, it's certainly leaving chemical trails, that's true. So there is a, uh, so it, uh, it's moving in a fluid, so there's, hyperdynamic interaction between uh, the powerful and uh, neutrophil. There could be chemical uh, traits. I'm not very sure whether there are in this case, but maybe there are. Uh, yes, of course, that's that's there. But still, uh, you know, in order for... Imagine that this is leaving a chemical trail and this has to move. What you want to do is you want to... So, you leave a chemical trail means you have a gradient of a, a density field that is being generated. And you want the orientation of this particle to be to be aligned along the gradient, right? right. So, and then once it's aligned on the gradient, it has to move up the gradient, right? right. So, so this is called taxis. Taxis. So, the taxis. So taxis is movement, phoresis is realignment. And would these, would, yeah, would these uh, um, features uh, come about because of activity? So both these are active, uh, active features. So to my second question, so regarding that, uh, uh, Simulation you saw that you showed of uh, some red particles, red active particles in a field of passive, mm -hmm. in a passive sea. Yeah. Uh, so in that, uh, the no, there was a noise related to the angular yes. orientation, right? Yes. yes. So, but uh, I observed that they are mostly moving towards the right. Uh, so in the, the simulations, that I yes. Yeah, yeah. So there, the noise was uh, shut off. In the simulation, the noise was shut off, or made very small, okay. but it essentially shut off. In the analytical calculation also, you said let's, let, let the noise be along, let's say, one axis. You, you, but then you go to the sort of co-moving, co-rotating frame of that and then that becomes a little more. So what uh, I should take away is probably that it's easier to follow behind the active pattern. Yeah. Because of but, but it's, not only, it's not only following, it's also catching up. Yes. So it's, it's seeking it and, and catching up. That's, that's the interesting part. It's like Tackling through a sea of people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 Y